All right. So welcome everybody to today's Halmstead Colloquium. Uh, the Halmstead Colloquium is a series of distinguished speaker uh, lectures. It's sponsored by two sensors, two centers at Halmstead, uh, Kaiser and Ceres. Uh, both centers are funded by the Swedish Knowledge Foundation, the KK Foundation, and the theme for the uh, for the colloquium series is cyber physical systems and embedded systems broadly. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker today, Professor uh, Radu Grusso. Uh, Professor uh, Grusso did his PhD at the University of Munich and then went on to be a research scientist at uh, UPenn. After that he went to uh, Stony Brook and he was an associate professor there and recently he's moved back to Europe uh, to the Technical University of Vienna where he's a professor and he's the head of the Dependable Systems uh, Group. Um, he has won, won many distinguished awards including, including the NSF uh, Career Award and uh, his talk is maybe the uh, most diverse of the talks that we've had so far so um, I welcome you to this talk and uh, please welcome Professor Grusso. So thank you very much for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and I had uh, uh, so far two very, very enjoyable days. Uh, so uh, my, my talk is uh, going to, to show you the connections. Uh, so we are, we are talking about cyber physical systems and uh, uh, we are trying to build these cyber physical systems and ask ourselves what are they, how are they going to look in the future. And uh, so my theme now is that actually we have already cyber physical systems, we just have to look at them. And these are the ones that we haven't built them, but uh, uh, so nature built them, so we can learn from them. Okay, so let me start a little bit with the history of cyber physical systems, maybe if for, for the ones that are not very familiar with this terminology. So let's start with the good old times when uh, uh, the world was still all right, and uh, that means it was continuous. Okay, so uh, the king was Sir uh, Isaac Newton, and uh, the queen was mechanical engineering. So actually, if you, if you go in Vienna, you're going to see that all the statues that are aligned there, they were all mechanical engineers, okay. But then something bad happened, okay. The world suddenly changed and it became discrete. And the new king was Alan Turing. And the new queen was computer science, okay. So now uh, the continuous believers and the discrete believers uh, started to fight each other and uh, uh, after years of fighting, uh, the two kingdoms uh, decided to strike a compromise. And uh, the compromise was that mechanical engineering pretended that computer science didn't exist, and computer science pretended that uh, mechanical engineering doesn't exist. Okay, now in the meantime, there was a very small community that wasn't considering itself neither continuous nor discrete that started developing controllers. Uh, completely isolated, small footprint. The main question was, can we make them work? Okay. And uh, once they started to do this, uh, things got more interesting. So they, they uh, started doing something like network embedded systems. Uh, and for example, a car is a network embedded system. So now you suddenly have a lot of embedded systems. You have brakes that uh, are, uh, think, think of themselves. Then you have cruise control, you have GPS, you might have wireless networks, you have speed sensors, you have distance sensors, and then you have a, a bus. And I, I wrote there Copets in the bus because uh, so Copets, uh, my predecessor, created this time triggered uh, uh, deterministic networks. So, so you would like to to have very deterministic communication because you have to do a lot of control. So now the question is, are these things good? Ah yes, they are very useful. And uh, so I, 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 I was told that this sounds a little bit chauvinistic, but really my wife is driving better than me. So I was f laughing at her, okay, uh, because she's parking, she has all these gadgets, camera back, and uh, she's, she's now parking in places where I cannot park, okay? And uh, because I, I still don't use these gadgets. So I say, okay, I, <laughs> I don't need them, but in fact, they are very, very useful. And uh, the only problem is when they don't work, then you get in trouble. But otherwise, when I'm, 
with my wife and with her car and we have to park, I say, you do it, okay? I, I, I don't do it because I might not be able. And I, so, as I said, in fact, she parks uh, even better than me. Okay, so now, what happened? So, the, the life evolved <laughs> and uh, we, we got to something even more sophisticated, which uh, are several physical systems. So now you want uh, not only to have cars, uh, but you have uh, these cars to communicate to road junctions. So now uh, you suddenly are in a scenario where you have lots of cars driving around, and you have airplanes, you have... Uh, and now what you see is that you, you have multi-scale, because if you go, get down to a car, then you have all this complexity within a car. But then now here you have the space. And if you look, you have also time. I mean, uh, just... You know, if I do fast enough, you are going to figure out that there is time also. So, so you have space and you have time. And uh, so you have a, a multi-scale uh, system. And this is actually, I think, our, our greatest uh, uh, challenge. How to, to make sure, how to manage complexity. And uh, you also have uncertainty. I mean, because in this situation, now suddenly this is something that we were not considering so far. Uh, a car driving cannot say for sure what is going to come from the other places. So there is also the possibility to be surprised and it has to adapt itself to, to the uncertainty. So suddenly, uh, let's say probability theory uh, pops in and kicks in and we have to, to take it into consideration. Okay, and now what's the vision of the future? Everybody has heard probably about it, is the so-called Internet of Things and the Internet of Services. So now the question is, how are we going to, to create this? Everybody is talking about it. This is the next vision. Uh, it's going to happen. Nobody knows precisely how, but everybody is trying. To, so I was recently invited at, uh, in Berlin to, to give a talk about the cyber physical systems in Europe, and they, they made a study. Uh, uh, about cyber physical systems, so the Academy of uh, Engineering uh, and uh, Science, and they were recommending, and they were saying that there is a short niche, and they, there has to be action from the political side, and but and to create opportunities and to see what kind of niches are going to be, what kind of business models are going to be developed, and uh, it's not so clear yet how are these going things to work. And then my, my uh, okay, before I get into this, so my, my uh, idea is that actually uh, we have cyber physical systems around that were created by million years of engineering, okay, or maybe billions. It's only that it was no, not us, but the nature that did the engineering. And I, I'm going to show you, uh, as an example of a cyber physical system, an electromechanical pump, okay? which is, as I said, not our, not our creation. And uh, one of them, I'm going to say, show you two pumps. One, one of them is working properly, the other one has a bug. So sci even, even nature makes mistakes. And let me show you the pump. So I hope it's, it's not too graphic for you. And by the way, these are dogs. Uh, so I, I don't, I, that's not a good thing, <laughs> but they are not human. So, uh, so this is actually the one, let me, so this is the one that fu functions properly, if I go back. So you see it pumps regularly, everything is fine, whereas this one has a bug. So you can see the bug actually, so it has atrial fibrillation. So this is the atrium, and uh, you see that flutter, that fast flutter. So that actually, uh, you can live with it very well. Uh, and uh, most of old people have, have it. But uh, if you have it in the ventricle, so these bigger parts are the ventricles, then uh, you have around three minutes to survive. Okay, and that's why you have all these defibrillators in the, in the airports. So these are for, for, for the ventricles. Okay, but the ventricles start to do the same thing, this kind of fluttering. So, so now the question is, whose problem is this to solve? Okay, so who should solve this problem? And obviously the doctor said, okay, it's a medical problem. It is their problem to solve. Okay, and uh, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, the diseases of the heart, rank on, uh, on, according to the 2006 statistic, in the United States, it ranked on place on first place. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that actually the second place and the third place together has less fatalities than than the heart disease alone. Okay, so 
uh, it's really uh, an important medical problem and the doctor is saying, okay, they have to solve it. But unfortunately, they cannot do it alone. Okay, so uh, if you look at the questions that they are asking, so I was talking to cardiologists and I asked them, okay, what is the main question you are asking about uh, the heart? And they were, they told me that both them, cardiologists, pharmacologists and patients, they are interested in what is the risk of a patient to develop uh, disorder. So a cardiologist I'm working with told me, look, I had two patients, they had precisely the same disease and one died. And the next one came to me and asked me, okay, can you tell me how, <laughs> how long do I still have? Okay? And she said, I don't know. I don't know, I cannot tell you. But she would, would have been very found to, 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 to know that. And, uh, and the second question is, under what circumstances these disorders? Because they are linked together. Okay, so uh, if you know in what environment something occurs or, or what, what parameters are wrong, then you can also estimate uh, uh, the probability of disease. Okay, and, uh, but if you restate the question, if you say, suppose I have uh, a, a specification of a disorder, so I can specify it. For example, I can say that atrial fibrillation, fibrillation is a spatial temporal phenomenon that starts with a spiral and that spiral breaks down in smaller spirals and this has to happen within uh, 20 seconds. Then I have a temporal specification of, of what the spiral is. Okay? And now suppose I have a model of the heart, then actually the question that I can ask is what is the probability of the model to satisfy the specification? Okay? And for what parameter ranges, so my model is going to have parameters, for what parameter ranges uh, does this model satisfy the specification? Okay, but if you put it in this way, then you say, oh, but that, that's something that we know about. I mean, that's something that we are trained to do. So uh, the question is, then is it our, it is our problem to solve. I mean, we know this is called model checking. I have a model, I have a specification, I, I want to see whether my model satisfies the specification. So it should be our problem. But, and uh, we, indeed, we started a, a project together. So uh, most of the results that I'm presenting here uh, are from a big project. Uh, it's called uh, Model Checking 2.0, combining the extract interpretation with uh, uh, model checking. And uh, then we actually abbreviated this to a center for uh, uh, modeling and analysis of complex systems. And uh, the PI, the main PIs of uh, this proposal were uh, at Clark and uh, from Carnegie Mellon and uh, Amir Pirelli from uh, NYU, which were both uh, Turing Award winners. So this was a very great big competition. It, it, it was an expedition, NSF expeditions, 20 million project where you com we competed actually with uh, the inventor of the internet, uh, who is now in the United States. So you really compete. So you really need heavyweight people. And uh, so here is Patrick Cousseau, uh, the uh, inventor of abstract interpretation. And uh, so you have here uh, Bad Misra, uh, who was, is that also in NYU, was a student of Ed Clark. So these are all computer scientists. Uh, this, and this is Gerald Holtzman, the inventor of uh, software model checking of SPIN. And uh, he's, he's uh, Klaus Havelund. Uh, he's actually one of the guys that invented runtime verification. And he, they are together at uh, NASA, uh, JPL. Uh, now this is actually, th these are uh, our, our corner of Stony Brook. So uh, this is, uh, uh, so everybody saw me in a uh, younger incarnation. And uh, so this is Scott Smolka, collaborator of mine, uh, James Glim. He's a, a mathematician. He's actually a, a president uh, award, um, a gold medalist of the United States, which is the highest, high, distinction that you can get as a scientist in the States. Uh, he's uh, working in fluid mechanics, okay, so, and, uh, but he had also other, other uh, contributions. Flavio Fenton uh, is a physicist uh, and he's our main expert and uh, with, together with uh, Rob, uh, Robert Gilmore, who is a physiologist. So these two guys are really, let's say, the experimental guys that, but it's kind of easy to talk to Flavio Fenton because he's a physicist, being a physicist, uh, he knows mathematics, you can talk, you have a common language, but he has also a wet lab that he's running together with uh, uh, Robert Gilmore. Where, uh, so the pictures that you saw, these videos were actually, uh, I, I got them from him. Uh, these two guys are uh, 
uh, both of them are uh, mathematicians and they, they are statisticians, they do statistics. Uh, Raz Cleveland uh, is also a computer scientist. Uh, this guy here is kind of the, the, big, the big man in the United States in, uh, in uh, uh, control theory, because you need control theory and uh, uh, Christopher Langman is doing genetics, uh, regulatory networks, James Feather is also in genetic regulatory networks. And we had four projects here, uh, so we wanted to see what is the analogy between embedded systems, uh, avionics and, and cars, and uh, we had two other applications, uh, um, pancreatic cancer on the one side and atrial fibrillation on the other side. And we were responsible in this project on, on atrial fibrillation. And this uh, really was, this was our team. I mean, this, uh, these were the guys with which we, we collaborated uh, in, uh, in our work. Okay, so now I, I was saying, okay, the doctors say it's their problem, but if you look closer to it, you might say it's also an engineering problem. And uh, then let's uh, look at it. So you can say it's a communication structure problem, because if you look at this, so this is the atrium, you are going to see that there are a lot of, uh, uh, so it's very thin, so it's actually transparent, so you can see through it. So this is one uh, from one side, this is from the other side. And if you look deeper into the structure of the heart, you are going to see that uh, it contains clock synchronization trees, like in hardware, okay? So nature dis discovered clock synchronization trees much earlier than we discovered them. And you can see here a clock synchronization tree, okay? So all these cells that are on the, on the, on the wall, they should be stimulated at the same time. So now this is your clock synchronization tree. And the clock is originating here. So, and it's actually a self-stabilizing -stab clock. Uh, it's the so-called uh, sinoatrial node. And uh, you have um, uh, millions of cells that actually communicate with them and uh, uh, then uh, uh, stabilize them and give a, a dependable clock. So this clock is then transmitted through these wires that you see here. And it, this is atrioventricular node, so the atrium is completely separated electro, uh, uh, electrically from the ventricle. And uh, so here it slowed down a little bit such that the atrium can uh, first uh, contract. And then, uh, after it's slowed down, then it's uh, distributed uniformly to the rest of the, such that they all contract at the same time. So now you can think about, uh, so why is this a cyber physical system? So think about, you have four billion cells, okay? Four billion cells, you have to coordinate them with each other. So they, they send each other signals, four billion, okay? And each cell contracts on its own, okay? So you have to achieve the, the synchronization of four billion cells that they do a common job together. And in doing this common job together, they have to communicate and synchronize with each other. And the, the, how do they communicate and synchronize each other? By sending this clock around. They say, okay, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to contract, and each of them contracts in their own. Okay, so it's, it's an exquisite uh, electromechanical pump, as I was saying. And uh, so if you look inside, you can, uh, so the way you, you, you create a model of this system, you, you want to first know what is the structure. And it's absolutely amazing what people do. They are physicists or biologists, or they really, give, they really reconstruct the structure of the heart. And here you see, so how do they do it? They, they use uh, diffusion tensors MRIs. So you, in order to, to do any distance simulation of the heart, you need uh, to, to have uh, the structure. How do you obtain the structure? By, by not only doing uh, MRI, but also shaking a little bit the molecules. And you look in what di direction they diffuse. Uh, so the water molecules uh, diffuse in the direction uh, that, that is preferred by the tissue. So this way you find out what is the orientation of the tissue and uh, in what order. So this gives you uh, these fiber structures that you can obtain. So you have a lot of fibers that, that keeps, uh, keep the cells together. And then you have a lot of vessels uh, uh, that, that actually feed the cells such that they have enough food and uh, they can contract. And then you have uh, also the anatomy of the rest of the cells. So these are the contracting cells. So how do you get this uh, uh, structure? Uh, by doing uh, horizontal slices. So what you see here, this is the atrium and this is the <laughs> ventricle, or doing vertical slices. So these are like, uh, if you do them like that, or you can do them like this, okay? So now if you put all these pieces together, you obtain essentially the, the structure of the heart. Okay, I mean, you, I, this is actually only the, the, let's say the communication structure of the heart. And uh, 
But then you talk to the cellular biologist and say, no, 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 it's, it's a cellular problem. Okay? Uh, uh, if you want to know what happens, you have to know what happens in every cell. Okay? So every node of these four billion nodes is doing a job and you have to understand what job it is doing. And uh, as you probably know, the cells originally developed in the oceans, in salty water. So the, the, the reason to create the membrane, which is nothing but fat, so it's a, a build, uh, lipid layer uh, that uh, is uh, hydrophobic in the inside and uh, 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 it likes the water on the outside, kept the sodium outside. So you see sodium is outside, but in order to, to uh, maintain a not too great difference of potential, uh, you had to have potassium inside. So you like potassium. Like I was saying, if you, if you play tennis, you see people eating bananas to replenish their potassium because the skeletal muscle cells are t cells like, uh, like these two. Okay? So you have sodium outside, you have potassium inside, so obviously you have a difference of potential. So this is an, a perfect insulator, it's fat, it's insulator, so you have a capacitor. Okay? And uh, you have a difference of potential and if you measure it from the inside to the outside, the difference from the inside to the outside, you get something that is called an action potential. Okay? And now this action potential, originally in, in at rest, is at a particular voltage, it's minus 80 millivolts. And what happens is, uh, when you put a little bit of a voltage on top of it, uh, this is called a patch clamp, you put on, on, the, on the cell, it gets uh, stimulated and uh, the sodium channels open. So the, the, sodium are, uh, the sodium channels are voltage dependent, so they are uh, kind of interesting proteins that when, when you stim uh, stimulate them a little bit, they open such that the sodium can flood in. So what happens, you have a, f a flood of sodium ions inside and uh, the potassium, uh, the, the level changes suddenly vertically. And then, for example, if you, and then the, the potassium kicks in to uh, so since you have a lot of sodium that, that uh, sorry, uh, you have a lot of sodium that got in, the potassium gets out, and then other mechanisms like the calcium kicks in and so on. So you have a long plateau, uh, which uh, which gives you enough time to contract. Okay, so this is this plateau that you see from here to here. Uh, it's only to give time to the mechanical part to contract. So if you are in neurons then actually uh, this, uh, the potassium, it's only sodium and potassium, so this goes down up to here, and you have a pulse. So if you are, if you are in the brain, you want to have very fast communication. You, you have only decision making, you have no, no activity that you have to perform, there is no mechanical things that you have to perform, so it's only information processing. Okay? So then you have very short pulses, it, it goes kind of here, so it's a, a couple of milliseconds. So that means that uh, the communication in the brain happens in the, in the millisecond time. Okay, and uh, so now you see you have a lot of things that go on. You have the sodium channels that go in, then you have a, 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 a leaking current, a background current, then you have the calcium uh, channels with the background, uh, then you have calcium uh, sodium exchangers, you have pumps because you get at some point too much sodium in, you have to, 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 to get rid of it. And how do you get rid of it? Uh, so if you look here, so you're going to see uh, in, the, in the last stage, you are, you are going to see these pumps, uh, these exchangers. So they, they uh, for example, this exchanger poops, uh, pumps uh, sodium in and pumps, uh, uh, sorry, potassium in, pumps uh, sodium out, and here it pumps uh, calcium in and uh, potassium out. And this is just a, a potassium uh, pump that pumps the, the calcium out of the cell. So you have all these processes and you have to describe each of these processes. And uh, for the contraction there is an additional mechanism that uh, uh, so the calcium actually performs the contraction, the muscular contraction, so you have all these mechanisms inside that, that does all, uh, this contraction. Okay, so at the end an electrical engineer comes to you and says, okay, but it's an electrical problem, okay, because now I can write all these currents, I know all these currents, I, and I can say that the derivative, if I say the capacitance is one, I can write, I can say, okay, this is, a, this is an electrical equation, the derivative of the, the voltage is actually the total current that goes through the membrane, and this is actually the sum of the currents that I have, plus my stimulus current. And, uh, sorry, 
And uh, so, what you, so this uh, equation says that the rate of uh, change in the membrane potential is the sum of the physiological currents due to, due to iron flow across the membrane. And uh, so this is kind of a complicated model. So this model has 67 variables, and it's, not, it's kind of tough to, to, uh, to um, simulate and to formally analyze. I mean, even simulation for this model, when, when uh, these people uh, created this model, uh, they were able to simulate it only in, uh, in 1D. I mean, only in a, in a string. They weren't able to simulate it in 2D. And now, uh, with the advances of computational power, with cheap power of supercomputing powers, you can sim And we found, so our colleagues, Flavio Fenton and his wife, he, he was simulating all these models, and they found out that there are bugs in the models, and they, they, uh, uh, they had to be uh, improved such that they work now in 2D. Okay? But now, s suppose you want to do analysis. You want to, do, to say, uh, exactly to answer to the problem. What is the probability that given this model I'm going to have a uh, atrial fibrillation? Okay, so suppose you want to answer this problem. So uh, in a formal fashion, then you are in trouble, okay, with 67 variables. So then what can you do? You can say, ah, what I do is I do abstraction. And this is what our friend Flavio Fenton did. He showed that if you abstract, if you say all the currents that get in fast, okay, I call them the fast input currents, and they are responsible for the upstroke. And then I don't have a fast output, but I have a slow input and I have a slow output. So I have only this current, this current, and this current, and I let them work. I can actually uh, simulate exactly the same form of the, of the action potential. And in this case, my uh, electrical problem reduces to write these four currents. The only problem that he has is that nobody believes him. Okay, he's going around, so nobody takes him seriously. He's going with this model, and they ask, are asking him, okay, how, how did you derive this model? And he says empirically, okay, through fitting. And they say, okay, but this has zero relevance to the actual problem. There is no connection to a model that we accepted as biologists because it's a model based on the measurements that we did, like the one with 67 variables, whereas this one is not based on these actual processes that are happening there. But obviously it works. So, so the question is, okay, what is the connection between the two models? Okay, and in this uh, project, we, one, one thing that was of, of interest of us was to establish a connection. Okay, and how do you establish a connection? You, you pick up one, one of the channels, for example, and this is the sodium channel. And in the sodium channel, you know that the current of the sodium is proportional uh, to a constant. And then you have uh, uh, two, two gates, an M gate and an H gate. And then uh, this is the difference of potential between them. And uh, so this is, uh, by the way, the, uh, the model created by, by Hodgkin and Huxley uh, that, that uh, earned them uh, a Nobel Prize in physics, uh, physiology. Sorry. And they, without knowing uh, the precise structure because they, they couldn't measure what's going on in the membrane, they hypothesized by fitting. By, so they, they saw the following way. So we should, there should be some channels that open and close, okay? <laughs> like this door. So I can open it, I can open it, and I have a rate with which I can open it, and I have, there is a rate with which it closes, okay? So the channels have two states, close or open, and there is a rate with which I open or I close the states, okay? And then they figure out that uh, there are two processes that, that are responsible. So one is for opening, and there is another process that is uh, responsible for closing. And the one that is responsible for opening is much faster than the one that is responsible for closing. And being good and trained mathematicians, they reasoned, OK, I have to take to the cubic power the very fast opening thing. Since they needed a cubic power, they hypothesized there must be three gates that are independent. Independence means that if, they, if you have probabilities, so here you have probabilities, the probability of being closed, probability of being open. So if the processes are independent, you have the product of them. So they said they have to be three, otherwise I wouldn't have cubic power. And then there is another process, there is this H gate that also is involved in this process. And when they are all open, then the gate cond conducts. And initially, they assumed that this gate, the H gate, is open, and these gates are closed, and they open very fast, and then this gate closes, and then the, uh, the, the channel is closed. The interesting thing is that 
after 20 years, people really found out these, channel, uh, these gates. Okay? They are molecular structures, but instead of being three gates, they figure out there were four. Okay? And the process is a little bit different. But still, I mean, it's an amazing f uh, force. So, uh, so they didn't get the, the Nobel Prize for nothing, these guys. Okay? And if you look at the mathematical, f what is interesting for us are these, uh, uh, these are actually continuous time Markov chains if the coefficients would be constant here, the rates would be constant, but, but they are not constant, they are influenced by the input, which is the voltage, the membrane voltage, so you have these, actually these are functions, they are not constants. Okay, so, so these differential equations, if, this were, if the coefficients would be constant, they would be linear differential equations, but since they are not constant, they are actually more complicated differential equations. Okay, and uh, in, in fact, so these are also under, uh, sometimes called continuous time mark of decision processes that you have. So this is kind of interesting because we don't even have to create this process. They, they, they are the pharmacologists that exactly do this stuff for us. So you go to the pharmacologist and they give you the models. And you say, okay, fine. So it's like you give, they give you the examples and then you say, okay, let me, uh, let me investigate interesting questions on, on, this, uh, on these models. And one question is, how can you show that this model is equivalent to this model? Okay, so any idea in the, in the public why, why these two models should be equivalent? So I have this model here. So I have only two, two gates, M and, M and H, I take the, but I, I'm looking at the power, uh, third order power of this and H, and they are opening and closing, and I have another one which looks like this. And I'm interested, instead of taking now M cubic H, I just take this O, and I say, okay, I'm interested in the probability of this guy. Now I'm claiming these two models are identical, they are one-to-one -one equivalent. So now the question is, why they are, are they equivalent? So, Anybody has an insight why they should be equivalent? So this is a more complicated. This has one, two, three, four, eight states. The other one has only two. Actually seven, because one of them is the sum. So the idea is actually this is a counting automaton. Okay, so what this automaton does, it says originally all my M gates are closed, so I can open three of them. Then I have one open and I can still open two of them and then I can open one. Now if I'm here, I can close three of them, I can close then only two and then only one. If I go down and up, I close this other gate. So originally I start here, this, this gate, the second gate, the H gate is open and I can go, get here. And then I'm really open and then I go down, I close the H gate, I come back and then I go up back, okay? So now you can prove that actually uh, uh, the other one, so you can really show, I'm not going to, to get into the details, but you can, you can uh, assign to every of these states, for example, this, this state that you have here, CO1, you can take, the, so you, what do you know here? You know that the gate M is closed, so you, uh, and so you have one minus M, because you have probabilities, and to the cubic po power, and you know also that the gate, H gate is closed, so you have 1 minus H here. And uh, now if you take the derivative of it, you are going to get a transition. So it's going to tell you from what uh, you have inputs and from what you are outputs. And then you can show, in fact, that uh, there is uh, uh, what is called an exact bisimulation. So this, uh, these two processes can simulate each other one to one perfectly, and you are not going to be able to distinguish between them. But this is a kind of interesting thing because then you would say, oh, but maybe instead of having this more complicated thing, I can use only these two things and maybe I can simplify my model. If I'm only interested in the voltage, maybe I can simplify my voltage. This is the only observable that I have. I can simplify my model to reduce it to less variables. And maybe I can reduce it to the four variables of, of our co colleagues, Flavio Fenton. Okay, and then, but then, unfortunately, this is not the model that they have in their, mo in their uh, uh, model that I showed you. The, the, actually, that model is called the ir mazari winslow model. So the actual model, after people really uh, made a lot of progress in understanding and doing visualization and really seeing the molecular structure of a membrane, they constructed this model. Okay, again, these are the pharmacologists. They are interested in this stuff because you want to, to give uh, uh, drugs, particular drugs, to, to make <laughs> the, the cells work properly. You want to control, in fact, what you do, you want to control them. Okay, you want to have a chemical control of, of these cells. So, so they figure out, okay, there are not only three of them, there are four. So now you see you count from four to one, okay? Four, three, two, one. 
And, and another thing that they figure out is that actually the rate of closing and opening of, of, uh, of this age gate that you had here is not dependent on the voltage. Okay, so they are constants here now. But they depend on how many gates were closed or open. So if, you, if all the gates were closed, you go with these two constants. If one gate is closed, then you go with these constants, multiply with A. If two are them, then you multiply, divide with A square, and so on up to multiply, divide with A cubic. So although they are not dependent on the voltage, they are dependent on the number of gates that closed. Because you have some kind of, you can think about it, uh, you have this, uh, there is a kind of a mechanical things, thing going on. So you have kind of protein structure, and this closing actually influences in some way what, what you can close uh, the other ones in a, in a mechanical fashion, okay? But then you can say, ah, but if I go this way, so I, I take the cycle this way, so actually if I go this way down from C0 to uh, from C00 to C01, and I do enough, you know, I, I'm, getting, I'm going to get dizzy and I'm going to have uh, uh, to, to, to believe that I'm going with the voltage up and down, because this transition depends on the voltage and this transition depends on the voltage. So indirectly I'm going to get a transition that de depends on the voltage itself, okay? And this is what this model says, that you go this way and this way. So now the question was, is it possible to create an approximate by simulation of this big, so you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, five of times two is ten, plus one, two, three, so you have 13 state variables, and here you have uh, four variables, but actually you need only one here, because uh, the sum of these two probabilities gives you one, and you need only one here, because the sum of the probabilities gives you one. So in fact, here one state is redundant, because the sum of the probabilities of the others one give you the one here. So from 13 you still need 12, okay? But now, going from, from 12 to, to two state variables, you actually win, you get rid of 10 state variables. And then we said, okay, can we show that we can get rid of these 10 state variables? And it turns out that you can, okay? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to learn these functions, alpha and beta. So now the problem is this model that I told you about, Hatchkin Huxley, it was developed for the neuron, okay? So it was de developed for the... Uh, uh, giant neuron of the squid. So it looks like the squid has a very large neuron, and at, at that time they didn't have a lot of techniques, so they were looking at uh, what the giant squid is, uh, uh, this giant neuron, and they found out the equations. But this is a, a model of a myocyte, of a, a hard cell, okay? And then we said, okay, let us learn these coefficients, these functions here, and then we can say, okay, I can substitute this with this. And how do you do it? You do it the uh, you, know, <laughs> you work hard, okay? So what do you do? You observe that if you, so what you, you fix a voltage for each of these. So you, once you fix a voltage, then you have a, a continuous time Markov chain, and then you simulate it. And, and you simulate it, oh, okay, so I, I'm don't, I'm not, I don't have here the, the way we were doing it, but this, this is what we did. So you, probably it's going to come up later. So you simulate it, and you get a curve, and then you want to find out what functions you would need here in order to get the same curve. And this way you identify the parameters. And then you change the voltage, and you try to, 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 to uh, simulate what this guy is doing by finding the right parameters that these guys have, need to have. And you can do this with an optimization process. So you, you, you play around with the values until, until you minimize the distance between what these two guys would produce and what you have seen here. Okay, now once so once you have a model, what you can do with it, you can uh, simulate it. So you can say, no, actually it's a simulation problem. And in fact, most of the biology and most of the physics, that uh, applied physics that is doing today is, is, uh, uh, is in fact simulation. People simulate, like to simulate. And if I talk to my mathematician friend in Stony Brook, he told me, okay, computer science was invented in order to do simulation of nonlinear equations in mathematics and physics, okay? And if you look, there is a lot of truth in this, okay? So this was the one origin of computer science, was to simulate things that you couldn't find out in closed form. So now here we have this model of Flavio Fenton in four, four variables, which is kind of sophisticated because you have, it's a hybrid model. So you have these nonlinear differential equations that hold in this state, and you have nonlinear differential equations that hold in this state, a little bit different, and a little bit different that hold in this state, and a little bit different that hold in this state. And you go from one to the other if your voltage passes a particular threshold. And when you go below the threshold, you come back, okay? So now, how do you simulate this? 
you, if you do it in 2D, you have a large tissue with a lot of cells, and every cell has this model, this hybrid automaton model, and it has an input. You see here an input E that I put it. So this input E is actually the, the you pull your neighboring cells and you look at the voltage. So this in mathematics is written like this, with nabla, nabla, it's a Laplacian. So you look at the diffusion of the voltage of the neighboring cells towards you. And that diffusion you, is an input to your model, and then you do whatever. Uh, so, and this is actually a partial differential equation system that you, <coughs> you have to solve, and you can simulate it. And I'm going to show you a couple of simulations. But if you want to do analysis, the problem is you have all these nonlinear functions. So what, what did we do? We figured out, okay, can we linearize these nonlinear functions? Okay, because if we have a linear system, then we can do better analysis. So we developed actually an all optimal non -lin uh, linearization algorithm that takes a curve and, uh, and uh, rewrites it in a piecewise fashion. So it finds uh, uh, a polygonal approximation, which is uh, better than a particular approximation error that you want. And once you do this, you, you get a new automaton, and you can simulate this automaton. And then you can say it's a simulation problem, and you see this is done on GPUs, and this is done on multi-cores. Okay, on, on, uh, yeah. So now, uh, you know, depending on your problem, you can say which one is better. Okay, so what do you prefer? So we ended up preferring the GPUs. And uh, so let, what's wrong here? Oh, sorry. And uh, we were able to do simulations for, for various... Uh, models, one in eight variables. So all these models actually were created independently for each other without any connections between them. There is one in eight variables, there is one in 19, uh, 19 and this is the, the IR that is in 67, and this one that we simulated here is in the four variables of Fenton. And here are the s scale up of uh, how fast you can do it on GPUs. So uh, you can see that you are, uh, you, you can do it in real time essentially on, on a surface 1024 by 1024. 1024 by 1024, four variables we can do it in real time. One second of simulation is one second of, of real time. But then you see the, the more variables you get, the, the more complicated it is. And actually, the simulation time costs you uh, with the square of the number of variables. Okay? And then we had a, a, a summer session. Um, a CMAX summer session where we use crowdsourcing. So this is a, a new new technology, crowdsourcing. So uh, that means instead of using the power of computers, you use the power of the brains of the students that you have in your in your uh, cur curriculum. So now each each pair of students got a pair. Uh, each student got a pair of these two values, which are two parameters, and it was asked, he, he was asked to simulate this and see what you get. So now I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times eight. 64. So we had around the 20, 25 students in the class, so now you can figure out how we do the groups. And they were, so they got to do more of them. And then you get this picture, which shows you the importance of the parameters on the, on the shape, shape of, the, of the stimulus. Okay, so you can see here that if uh, in this region you have uh, very, very thin spirals, here they are opposite, very thick, and here they break up. So this is really the fibrillation. So this is really the area where you don't want to get it. I mean, the cells that you saw doing this, they had these parameters, okay? And this brings us to the question, is it possible to, to find out what are the parameters in an automatic fashion, not by using crowdsourcing, okay, not using your students. And here what you see, it's also kind of interesting. Here we were tracking the, the course of the spirals, and you see this kind of interesting flowers. And here you have no flowers, because things get very ugly. And. Uh, just to see the, that this is a simulation, and uh, actually that simulation is uh, kind of cool, uh, you have here our simulations of uh, 3D models. And uh, so uh, here, what you see inside, so in, in 3D, these are like vortices, are like uh, tornadoes, and you see the filaments inside the tornado. So these are this red stuff, so are really the filaments of the to tornadoes going around them. So these are uh, around. So we got these models. So these are canine models and uh, sorry, pig models. And they uh, so we, we got all the cells of them. They are in fact 3D. So if you would slice them, you would see what's going on in 3D. And that's why we are showing here the filaments inside. And we were simulating so around four million uh, cells, and you simulate them by using GPUs. And here, what we do is a 2D simulation where we change the parameters. So we show that by changing the parameters of your uh, diffusion medium. You, you change the properties of, uh, of, 
uh, the diffusion. So you can get to more, uh, you know, and you see here how they, you, you are changing the parameters. So, uh, and eventually you can change the parameters. It's like a chemical change <laughs> of what is going on, such that you can if, uh, essentially get rid of any stimulus. So here we change enough the parameters such that it's like you, you put enough chemicals to, uh, to, to make sure that there is nothing going on there. Okay, and uh, if you come from, from where I'm coming, then you are going to say, no, this is a verification problem. So you would ask yourself, uh, so you have, this, you have this automaton for one cell, and then you ask yourself, what would happen if my cell never gets in, in this state? Okay, so it doesn't get excitable, so it doesn't generate that pulse. What would it happen? And here you have a picture where we stimulate here and uh, the, uh, the wave propagates, and here we have a, a small island of cells that never reach this state. So you can write this as a property to verify. You say always the voltage is below this threshold, so the threshold is this one. So this is a globally u is less than theta, so you write your your uh, uh, linear temporal property, this is a safety property, and then you ask, you know the ranges of GO1, GO2, let's say GSO and GSI, so you need the, know their overall ranges and you ask yourself for what intervals in these ranges I'm not, never going to hit this state, okay? And uh, see what happens if you, you don't hit that state. So on the left everything is fine, and look what happens on the right. So this is actually what happens if you have a scar in your, in your heart. And if you have a, a similar scar in your brain, then you have epilepsy. So, uh, you, you know, like Alexander the Great, and probably got the sword on his. <laughs> okay, so, so this is what, and you can solve this problem uh, by what we were doing. I'm not going to get into the details, so you have a state space, and the idea is to partition the state space uh, in, in a smart way. And by partitioning it in a smart way, you get finite automata. And now you have a, a finite verification problem. You have a property, and you have a finite automata. Now, how you construct the tra transitions of this automaton is kind of cool. So what you want to do is to change. So here you see the flow. Sorry. You see, you see the, it's like a, a potential, like a, a field. And you want to change, change the parameters of the field such that instead of going that way, you go back. Okay. And after you change, so this is, you modify the parameters to change the way the field behaves. And if you do that, actually you can, you can block uh, uh, the propagation. And uh, so we were doing this in SpaceX and uh, with another tool uh, uh, for multi-affine systems. And then we, we, we were able to identify the ranges in, in this state for which you are never going to get out. Uh, what do we have to do is to, to change, to make sure that this rotates here and doesn't get here? And what you have to do, so here we had two parameters and uh, we, we got a, an affine combination and we were able to, to play with them and uh, f uh, make sure that they, they behave the way we wanted. And finally, you might want to have control, okay? So we were using this simulation, so this was the work of Flavio Fenton. So here, normally the fibrillation is, this is what you see, so here. And according to people that had the fibrillator, is like punching you in the breast. So it's very strong. So now the question is, can you use five low energy shocks? And here, instead of having that huge shock, you have uh, five smaller shocks, which are actually with a 19, so that really doesn't, you, you don't feel like hit full power in, in your chest, okay? And uh, so they, they did this uh, by, by doing the simulations that you see here on the left. Uh, so that we used the simulation. So the only parameter that you, you, you were able to control was the voltage, okay? And that, for that, it was enough to be able to do simulations of the voltage. You didn't care about the rest, okay? And, uh, but you care about the structure, because actually each of these each of these vessels could reflect the propagation of the voltage, okay? And you can think of every vessel reflecting the propagation of the voltage was a new source of uh, voltages. And uh, so this, uh, this, they published these results in, uh, in Nature uh, in uh, uh, 2011, and then here you see how much uh, your de defibrillation, uh, so you, you went from uh, uh, 1.6 joules to 0 0.08 joules. Okay, so, what did I say? It's a simulation, it's a molecular, it's a cellular, and so on. And I and ended up with a control problem. And uh, 
uh, I will end up my, my talk saying that it's actually a CPS problem, a cyber physical system problem. And the idea is that uh, we are on the brink of a paradigm shift in the, in the way uh, the diagnosis and treatments of cardiac diseases, but not only of this, also of biological diseases, any other disease, uh, for example, cancer. And uh, it's really up to us uh, uh, to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the great talk, Roger. Uh, questions from the audience? Can you show this transformation in the hybrid automata to partial differential equation? It's not really clear from the. How did you get how did you get this transform from the ordinary differential equation to the partial? You can repeat the question. Yeah, so so the question was, okay, how how do we get from, uh, actually, how do we get from partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations? So, I, actually, I can, that, so there are several steps here to, sh to show. So, the way you go from partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations is uh, the following. So, this is a partial differential equation. Okay, so now what you do, so this partial differential equation kind of quantifies in a continuous way your environment. So it says the, the neighboring, my neighboring is going to uh, act on me with this Laplacian. Okay, so now there are two ways of, uh, of uh, approaching this. One is what we use, finite difference method. And another way, if you want to do an electromechanical simulation of the heart, then you do have to use finite element methods, okay? So here, and actually, you know, so what is, what for me is a very chilling experience talking to these guys, okay? So if you talk to mechanical engineering guys and all these guys, they know finite element, you know, it's not easy, believe me, finite element, try and read it, okay? Yeah. You have a lot of, you know, just take the laws, the mechanical laws that act there and, I'm really astonished, and I'm showing my students, I said, look guys, you think you are doing complicated stuff, and uh, you know, I just showed this to a colleague of mine, to Kopetz, and he said, oh, but you cannot send this to, to uh, FP7, this has to be a research project. I said, no, no, these guys are doing this, you know, on a daily basis, it's only that they are not computer scientists, they are mechanical engineers. Okay, so, so if you do finite difference methods, what you do is you, you, you essentially partition, you put a grid on top of it, and then actually what you do is you, you make the difference between your own voltage and the voltages that are around. So you sum up the voltages around and you take the difference with your own voltage. Essentially you discretize a differential equation, okay? You discretize and, and you replace then this, this uh, uh, Laplacian, you replace it with every cell has this input, okay? So now sure you have like a medium. That to every it gives to the every cell it's the right thing. Or you can think that every cell first asks its neighbors, okay, what is your voltage? Then looks at its own voltage and then it, it computes the input and then it sees what to do. So this brings you to from partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations. But this doesn't mean that they are simple because they, you see they are not linear here. So the next step then was to, to linearize them. So we got to by doing this linearization here. And by doing the, this linearization, we got to this system, okay? So now everything that is here is linear, but it's a little bit more complicated because these are super modes in some sense. Okay, so we linearized this, and now what we, what we ended up with was with a lot of thresholds, okay? So every piece actually in our polygonal linearization gave us a threshold. And then the idea was that these thresholds that you get in the voltage and uh, in the rest uh, gives you the granularity with which you are observing things. You cannot observe things with better granularity than that. So if you put these thresholds then on, on an axis, all the voltage threshold that we get, and then you have also some other thresholds for, for the other parameters, for the other variables, then you get these rectangles which give you the level of granularity with which you can really observe things. You cannot observe things at a better granularity than that. So then what you can do, you can identify all the elements. So th there are an infinity of points inside of these rectangles. But since you cannot distinguish between them, you can, add, and, uh, you can do an abstraction. And that brings you essentially to, after you do this abstraction, it brings you to a finite, uh, finite automaton abstraction. So you just have a finite set of states. And then you can, 
suddenly your problem had an infinite number of states that it was a very difficult problem to verify and you made but you said look I, 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 I cannot anyway distinguish between these two guys why don't I put them together in one state okay you do this you get a finite abstraction and on this you can apply model checking you know the classic model we applied actually SMV which is the classic model checker that developed a symbolic model checking uh, verification en engine de developed at CMU by Ed Clark and his students Yeah, so we didn't really care here about, we didn't uh, care about numeric precision, but this is actually a great question, in fact, because often when you have uh, sets of constraints, okay, let's say differential equation constraints, or uh, just constraints between, uh, on real variables, you can show that for, for particular functions, uh, if you have exponential functions, you have constraints with exponential functions, the problem of deciding these constraints, finding the input for which they hold, is undecidable. And now the funny thing is, if you consider the arithmetic precision of the machine, and you say, look, so you can think of these constraints separating an area where the constraint is satisfied from the area where the constraints are not satisfied. Okay, let's say it's a line, okay? So you want to find this line. Now, the interesting thing is, now this line has zero thickness. But now if you consider arithmetic precision, you can say, okay, actually I have a thick line. And the thickness of my line is really the, 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 the depth of my precision, okay? If you do this, almost all problems that were undecidable become decidable. And this is what uh, our collaborator Ed Clark with his student Shikun Gao is doing. So they uh, developed a, an SMT solver, it's called DREL. So uh, SMT solver means satisfiability modulo theories, where they make this assumption of thickness. And with this, they are able to solve nonlinear problems that, uh, because whatever, so SMT, the classic SMT solvers, they require you to be linear, okay? So suddenly, if you have nonlinear, they say, sorry, okay, to, <laughs> sorry for you, linearize first and then give it to me, okay? And then, uh, but when you linearize, you do, a, you know, you lose, also lose precision mm -hmm. because you have to do an abstraction. And actually, this seems to be very promising. So we are using it actually to analyze mixed signal circuits. Okay, because you know, what's the difference? <laughs> this is a mixed signal. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's in the heart or it's in a, you know, in a switching circuit that uh, controls my car. It's the same thing going on. Other questions from the audience? So I have a quick question. You mentioned SpaceX, and I get the impression that actually in terms of reachability analysis, it seems to be the state of the art or one of the leading. Yeah, so actually, if you look at this equation, so we couldn't use SpaceX on them. So, and let me show you why. Uh, because, so you, you can think that these biological circuits, they are products of rounded steps, okay? So now if you linearize, so, uh, yeah. So what you do is, so these rounded steps are actually what you have also in the analog circuits, okay? You don't really have steps. I mean, this is uh, an approximation that we computer scientists do, okay? But the, the, these are the rounded steps that the nature is doing, okay? And now it depends. You can, you can have it very, a very fast rounded step, or you can have one that is very slow, that goes like this. And they influence actually the shape of what's going on, okay? So now what, now your decision circuits, they are sums, they're, it's really, they're like in the uh, disjunctive normal form. So they are sums of products of sigmoids, okay? So it's like the normal form, it's and or, okay? So or of, <laughs> but, but you multiply sigmoids, okay? So now when you linearize them, what you get, so when you linearize the sigmoid, Essentially, you, you go with pieces like this, okay, with segments, uh, and like that, okay? So for every segment, I'm using a variable, let's say x, okay? So now if you do this, you're going to have products like x1, x2, and so on, xn, okay? Products of variables. Now a system that has this property is called multilinear. It's not linear. So linear has to be only, so let's say you have A1, and then plus A2, and then you have X1, X2, and so on, okay? This is a multilinear system. So if you have only A1, X1, plus A2, X2, 
This is a linear system. Okay, now SpaceX can do this. Okay, and uh, so now you are telling me that they might be able also to take a nonlinear system, and I have, we have to experiment with this. Take this one and make it this. Okay, and this is actually uh, something that we are working on. So, uh, so this tool that we used that does this abstraction was developed actually for gene regulatory networks. Okay, and uh, then we show that <laughs> it really doesn't matter. The heart, if you write down the equation for the heart, they end up to be the same as for gene regulatory networks. So, so their, their tool is called Time Rover, okay? And, uh, and the other one is called SpaceX, uh, which, which can analyze this, okay? So we are, we, we, actually I have a student, but he had uh, uh, now exam, so we wanted to send a paper to CMSB with a tool that we call it Space Rover, okay? <laughs> So which, which, which performs this automatically, this translation, and is able to, to simulate what is going on. And because you have to be careful, I mean, you want to do a simulation. So what happens is in this abstraction that we are doing, we lose time. Okay, so we, uh, so it, when, when you go, if you have a stimulus, we assume that the stimulus is forever here. So if you get a stimulus, then you get here, okay? And then you have stimulus forever. But this is not true because actually it's like a, a boxing match, you know. I hit the guy, he's falling down and he comes here and then I hit it again and that's it, okay. It's not the same, okay, now I give him, uh, you know, two days to recover and then uh, punch again, okay. So with this uh, time abstraction you lose this information, okay. So that's why you would like to do, uh, so you would like to not lose time, but you would like also to not lose all the derivatives because the derivatives tells you what is the speed with which things are happening and in which direction are they happening. And you lose all this when you do your finite automaton abstraction. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yes, Tony? Uh, in the beginning you talked about these two finite uh, state models, so uh, we have two states and eight or twenty. Yeah, yeah. By simulation to show they were yeah. equal or similar. What the, the more complex one was it the composition of implementation elements and the first was some kind of hypothesis? So this one was the, this one that you see here. So as long as people didn't have uh, really mechanisms to, to, to visualize what's going on, okay? So this is the Nobel Prize formulation, but the, for the neuron, okay? So the, <coughs> this is the sodium channel formalization of the neuron that they experimentally determined. They, simply <coughs> uh, hypothesis or that they, they, they didn't have any, they, they was only hypothesized. Everything was hypothesized by these guys. And also this function here, I mean, because they needed m cubic age, they hypothesized that they have to be three m gates and one h gate. It turned out to be m four, but still it was a very good <laughs> you know, intuition. But the point is they used, so since these are uh, Markov chains, okay, the sum of the probabilities of these two guys is one, so you can use only one variable like I did here, so I write one minus m for c, and I write here uh, one minus h for this o, okay, so you have one variable and one variable. If you write the differential, so now we can do the same thing, writing the differential equations like here for the neighbors, okay, so so you write as many differential equations as state variables you have. So now you have in fact 12 because the, the, uh, this one results from the rest, okay? But this is really what they saw. I mean, they, they really now they know, okay, I have that... Uh, they know everything was what they could observe, as you say. Yeah, this is really done biologically. So yeah. yeah. But now the question is, if I want to know, let's say I want to know how, how particular, I want to knock out particular channels, okay, or particular gates. So if, I, if I'm interested in all this information here, because every state here is really a particular gate, you know, communicating or not communicating. So if, I really, if I'm really interested in them, okay, then I need, I need this, okay. But if I'm really interested only in the sum of these two guys, okay, I, I don't, I, I cannot observe the rest, I'm just interested if I, I sum up O1 plus O2 or I take m cubic V. So if I'm only, so this, if this is my only observation function, then our statement is that it makes absolute no sense to have a model where you use this, okay? So you, you should be able to get rid of the all, all, all this complexity and sub, substitute one for the other. Now sure, if, I, if I'm curious how to, 
to influence, let's say, chemically this particular gate, I'm going to need the entire model. And this was our idea. So our idea was, okay, suppose from the cell you are only interested in the voltage. Okay, then why should you know anything about this channel, this particular, uh, or this particular gate? Okay. All right. Well, I think we can uh, continue our questions and conversations outside. Uh, there's some coffee and cake uh, waiting for us. Uh, we have a small gift from the university for you. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Radu. <laughs> thank you for the great. I time. feel like uh, winning the Wimbledon. <laughs> 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 I have to. Make <laughs>